Hello church, today is the last day in office for Stephen Worley as Children, Director of Children's Ministry and Communication. But he stays as the member of the church and he promised that. <laughs> He's holding me to my word, yes. I, so I am uh, no longer going to be in office as the Director of Kids Ministry and Communication. Sunday is my last day. Uh, but I am staying on as a church member. My wife and I are staying on as church members. I'm still going to be here to attend with you. I'm still going to be here to serve with the kids' ministry uh, on a monthly basis. And I'm still going to be here uh, to hopefully learn in some Bible studies, teach in some Bible studies, uh, and be a, a church member here, an involved church member. So that's the hope uh, over the next weeks and months. But uh, this will be my last video as Director of Kids Ministry and Communication. Uh, and we've loved making these update videos on what's happening, uh, the life of our church and its involvement in what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to uh, what this next season will bring. Uh, but today we're going to be focused in on about three things that uh, we can give updates on and three things that we can pray for, uh, same three things. Uh, as a church family over the next weeks. Uh, so let's start off, Vlad, by tell us a little bit about uh, how pastors, or the ones you know, uh, in Ukraine are doing and what the need is and how we can pray for pastors or the need for pastors. Ooh, that's a tough question. But one thing we realized pretty quickly, the church is not a building. Mm -hmm. I have a video right here that I'll probably share with David and he will see that that uh, that's what happens to the church and people still coming and celebrating to the Lord you know we'll, we'll, we'll see church is not a building church is a lot more than the building we realized it pretty quickly in uh, Ukraine in so many areas when the churches were bombed because the churches were specifically targeted, and I explain you why. Church is targeted because the church is a foundation of the truth, and Christians are obligated to speak the truth no matter what. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the truth could lead to their death. Mm -hmm. That's what happens to John the Baptist, for example, you know. He's picked out of the things that, you know, other people would say, you know, why he gets into politics, you know, what, why does he care about whatever happens in the family of that king of Israel. Mm -hmm. But church is always going to be targeted. When people think about the church, they think about, you know, it's organization, it's a building, it's structure. In reality, church is a lot more stronger than a building and its foundation. So many churches being destroyed. So many pastors that rely on now we will build, we'll construct a beautiful church, we will gather the people, and you know, we'll create a ministry. Um, a lot of those guys have been pretty much in tough situation. Mm -hmm. But those who understand that church is based on the rock, on the Christ himself, and relationship inside the church that makes the church. It doesn't make the presentation it, it's not, uh, you know, how you, how beautifully you make your seats, how comfortable you make it, how wonderful your worship team is. It's a lot more than that. It's what in a people, inside of their hearts, what kind of relationship with God they have. And that relationship helps to go through tough times. And uh, these days is really tough time, times in Ukraine. So, how we can encourage pastors? First of all, you know, the prayer is one of the best and mighty tools that we have. Mm -hmm. Second, it's the taking care of the pastor's family. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of pastors, they not that old as me and have grandkids, a lot of pastors are young, they have kids, they have families, and, um, you know, it's so difficult to feed the families these days. It's difficult to protect them and provide for them. 
So encouraging the pastor for the ministry, we have to take a burden of the shoulders and uh, like t- get a little bit more involved in the pastoral family life. Help them to be focused on the other people. So many people come into the churches. I'll give you an example of a um, church that in the city of Irpen. Um, that was a beautiful church. Mm-hmm. And Irpen was the half of that was occupied. And it's so many tragedies happens in Bucha, Irpen, and Warzel, and other places over there. And people were running as a flocks to the church. They on subliminal level knew that God would protect them. And they ran to the churches. You know, there was so many different reasons why they ran to the churches. One of the reasons, you know, you couldn't buy anything when there is a war in town. There is no food, there is no nothing, you know, no water. Church has the basement and in that basement they had some some food and a lot of people stayed behind not a lot i would say small group of people stayed behind and uh, they did not know that god will use them and god make those people as the great witnesses for his cause so people were providing the shelter in the church people were providing a spiritual care they um, provide their support. Uh, it's difficult to imagine the situation when, let's say, your family is separated, some of your loved one killed, and the, the person is in such a distress, and the bombs are, you know, just exploding right, right next to you. Uh, so I mean. The only hope you have is Jesus, and that's exactly what the church is all about. This is the way the churches are, the real churches are. So relationship between within the church, between a leadership and people in the church, the bonding and love of Jesus, the love in practice, that's what makes the real church. And this is what we could learn from and um, mm-hmm. try to build it. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's, those are some ways that we can pray for uh, leaders who are on the spiritual front lines. But you've also made mention of some leaders who are on the uh, military front lines, uh, Christians or chaplains. Uh, can you give us an update on that and how we can pray for the Christians uh, who are in the Army of Ukraine and chaplains in the Army of Ukraine? This is always going to be a tough question. Because as the Christians, we're a people of peace. You know, we try to make a peace at tremendous cost. But when the war strikes, when it's not relational things, it's either life or death situation, different rules of light. And um, I spoke with Pastor Buzz about that. I had really difficult time of... Uh, fighting over you shall not murder thing. I was really trying to put my mind together. I, I knew that there are right things and wrong, wrong things to do, but it was not really clear to me in all the details. Pastor Bas helped me a lot. Um, he introduced me to doctrine of uh, just war. Uh, he uh, explained me what love is all about, that uh, Above the all, you love the Lord, you know, then after the Lord, you've got, you know, yourself, your family, your kids, your church, your neighbors, your country, and then love for the enemy is going, on, you know, all below that. So if somebody will come and will try to kill your family, loving your enemy, you will still love a lot more your family and your neighbor and your church more than that which is animal. I said animal, am I? And I'm absolutely right. Because uh, the people who became enemy in a certain way, they um, not coming to kill you with the good intentions. 
they trying to kill you because they wish it. They trying to take your stuff because in some way they've been possessed by evil, evil ideology and even more than that. Uh, so you have to stand your ground as a Christian and you have to protect your pastor, you have to protect your wife, you have to protect your kids, you have to protect your neighbors from evil at specific cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, our Christians, a lot of people have to review their relationship to that. And these days, war is already over the year, and so many, I know quite a few deacons of the church, I know pastors, that are on the front lines these days, mm -hmm. and they protect in the country. That's really difficult. Mm -hmm. That's really difficult for them, because they still love their animal, enemies, excuse me. In this case, it's enemy. And uh, they love it, but they have to do what they have to do, what the God called them to do. And there's always going to be a fight in their heart. And making the right choices is always going to be really difficult. I know a lot of chaplains that are on the front lines. And talking about chaplains, it's a really different story. Mm -hmm. It's chaplain as a pastor with the soldiers. And those soldiers, uh, when the pastor or chaplain ministered to them, they could lose their life anytime. A chaplain in the same boat with them, he could be captured or he could be killed too. By the way, if chaplain is captured together with his regiment or with some other soldiers, his treatment is not even close to what we expect under Geneva Convention. You know, the chaplains are the worst case scenario because they're not gonna give up, they're gonna state the truth they're going to serve the Lord, and they're going to die keeping their face. And the enemy always try to break the strongest one. Mm -hmm. If they would be capable of that, they will achieve the victory. This is why being a chaplain is a really tough job. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's pretty much like a death warrant on the front lines. Mm -hmm. We have so many people that need in the prayer. We do. We need to pray about our brothers and sisters that in a really tough situation yeah. where God put him in a place where they not like to be. You know, I mean, I, as a Christian, I don't like to be on the front lines. I don't like to point and shoot. But if that would be a God's will, we have to do what God called us to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it was discouraging, but also a, a call to prayer for me when you told me uh, last week that uh, it's the chaplains and the Christians when caught on the front line that are treated with a much more severe punishment uh, by their enemies than their fellow soldiers. So that was immediately a call for, for prayer uh, that I heard for uh, endurance, for encouragement for those believers and those chaplains on the front lines. Uh, so that's another way that we can be praying as a church for uh, our fellow brothers uh, over there in Ukraine. Lastly, uh, you shared uh, what was a very encouraging need over in Ukraine, and that is there has been an increased hunger for God's word in the Ukrainian language. Uh, there is a need and a desire for New Testaments and Bibles in the Ukrainian language. Can you share a little bit more about that? Absolutely. I'd love to do that. Uh, <clears throat> when I lived in the Soviet Union, Ukraine was a part of Soviet Union. It was the, I would say, occupied by Soviets in the 1920s, sometimes in that, that things, in that times. Um, Ukraine, Ukrainian language was suppressed. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, uncool. It was not really popular to speak Ukrainian, and it was on the state level. The schools uh, in Ukraine were transitioned in Russian language, and one of the Russians' ideology is that there is no Ukraine. Ukraine is a part of Russia, and there is no Ukrainian language at all. And that what the Russians ideology even today. Whoever, I'm speaking Ukrainian, and I understand that it's really different language than Russian language it is. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not saying better or worse, I'm just saying that it has deeper roots and more history than Russian language. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the different culture. And Ukrainian people always were Westerners in their mindset. If you would compare life in Russia and Ukraine, if you would ever go you know, a little bit deeper in Russia than Moscow and St. Petersburg, you will see the Russian culture in its best. And if you will go anywhere in Ukraine, far away from the big cities, you will see absolutely different picture. You will see the housing, the gardens, the fields, the songs, the relationship. You will see the churches. You will see people coming to God uh, on Sundays. Just one of my trips into Ukraine, I was driving in the western Ukraine with my wife, and it was Sunday morning. <laughs> and I see the whole village dressed up, you know, in the church closing. In that case, it was Ukrainian, you know, special closing. And they all were coming one way. And we passed by them and we'll see where they come in. Kind of like I was thinking some kind of event over there. But it was just a Sunday morning. They all were coming to church, the whole village. Um, what the difference between Russia and Ukraine, um, in the last 30 years, in Ukraine, more people come to know the Christ than in Russia and Europe altogether. Mm -hmm. So Ukraine became a Christian hub. And Ukraine starts sending missionaries in Africa, into Russia, in all over the world, into Asia. And this war, as I see uh, from a spiritual perspective, is to suppress that spirit, is to suppress that will. So, right now, what's happening, even in those territories that Russia captured in the beginning of the war, they've been liberated. Uh, a lot of people who used to speak Russian language stopped speaking the Russian language. They seen what Russian world is in its core. Mm -hmm. It's destruction, it's death, it's, I don't want to describe it. It's it just, I don't want to embed the hate into the people's mind, no. It's just the spiritual connection, which is, makes no sense. When a Russian Orthodox priest praying and saying, you have to kill, you have to kill, they are enemies, they, they are Satan, they are evil. That's what we hear, uh, what Russian people hear on TV all the time. They're fighting with Satan, they're fighting with America, but not with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Ukraine doesn't exist in their mind. So what happens when people who used to speak Russian and they realized why they speak in Russian language and what happens historically when Russia took over Ukraine, uh, Soviet Union took over Ukraine, and they propaganda-wise embedded the Russian language into people's mind. Right now is huge revisions coming back. It's a revival of Russian, I mean, Ukrainian language. This is why the people uh, don't want to even read the Bible in Russian language. I'm, I'm sorry to say in that. I'm sorry to say in that. The people uh, stop, so many people, like thousands and thousands of people stop speaking Russian who used to, and they would like to read the gospel and hear the word in Ukrainian. Don't take me as a nationalist, please. I'm not in that way. I'm just stating the facts that I receive from the other side. The people that used to speak Russian right now communicate in Ukrainian, and they would like to have a Bible to be read in their country, in their language. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge hunger, huge hunger right now. When our team's going you know, to serve in the specific places in the villages that were liberated, uh, um, along with the food, with water, with clothing, with the preaching, the people asking, can we have a Bible in Ukrainian language? So we get connected with Bible Association in Ukraine, <clears throat> 
and uh, we order for them to get us some. I don't know how much they could give to us, how many of uh, the Bibles, but we uh, would like to get as many as we can mm -hmm. and give our teams this opportunity to give uh, the Bible in Ukrainian language to people that have been liberated. Yeah. And, and that's just an encouraging to hear that there's a hunger for God's word and that there's a need and that we're, we're seeking to meet that need where we can provide New Testaments and the Bible in Ukrainian. Uh, and so I, I think it's a call for prayer for our church that we need to continue to pray. One, for us to have a continued hunger and desire for God's word as much as it seems that we are seeing over there but also to pray that God would continue to build that hunger, build that desire for his word in that language, uh, and that he would continue to supply those needs as he is, where his word can be printed, uh, can be distributed to all who are asking to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, to read God's word, to read the gospels, to read the, the whole Bible in Ukrainian, uh, and that he would continue to supply that, that we could be part of that supply in our generosity I think those are all great prayer requests. So to, to, to recap, we have prayer for pastors and churches uh, over there where there might be churches that don't have pastors that need pastors uh, or pastors that are discouraged currently. So we can pray for their encouragement, uh, for their endurance. Uh, we can pray for Christians and chaplains on the front lines uh, who are, when captured, experiencing great persecution. Uh, we can pray for their encouragement as well, that God would be with them, that God would give them perseverance in their current situation. Uh, and, and then we can pray for that hunger for God's word, uh, for the needs that we desire to be supplied, that God would provide his word, uh, his New Testament, his whole Bible in the Ukrainian nation, in, in, in the Ukrainian language for those who are hungry for it. Uh, those are three great areas or things to pray for uh, that we will continue to as a church. But uh, I wanted to thank Vlad for these continued meetings, these continued conversations, these times of prayer that have been encouraging and convicting uh, to me as a man. Uh, and, and it's been a joy to do these videos with you, to work alongside you, to call you a brother in Christ, and a, a member of my church. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And thank you for your service to our church. Of course. My pleasure. For the God's glory. Thank you. Amen. Have a great day.